Hello, I'm Chris Browder, and this is video 2.3 in Lesson 2. This is the third video in a series that provides a brief overview of SLA theories. In the last two videos, we discussed some of the older theories of second language acquisition and introduced some of the contemporary theories. <clears throat> This presentation is largely based on two texts. The first one is Understanding Second Language Acquisition by Rod Ellis. And the other one is uh, Lightbound and Spada's uh, text, uh, How Languages Are Learned. In the last presentation, I introduced Krashen's input hypothesis and his claim that all second language acquisition happens as a result of comprehensible input. Krashen states the following extreme positions about second language acquisition. First, um, acquisition is driven by comprehensible input. Second, output, like speaking and writing, does nothing to contribute to second language acquisition. Third, grammar instruction makes no difference. And fourth, acquisition is an unconscious process. In the last video, I stated that much of SLA research since 1977 has really been a response or investigation into these extreme claims. In this video, we will see some of those responses. Let's begin with Long's interaction hypothesis. Long's interaction hypothesis asserts that face-to-face -face interaction helps drive acquisition. In other words, interacting with others in the target language helps learners acquire second languages faster than just passive listening. Long supported his claim with, uh, I guess you'd say, examples. Um, for instance, sometimes when someone is speaking to a language learner, the accompanying interactions with the learner help the speaker realize that the listener is struggling to comprehend, and as a result, the speaker chooses to slow down or speak more clearly. The speaker might choose to paraphrase some or even provide a visual to help the learner understand him. You could say these are... Um, communication strategies, but uh, they help the learner um, learn. So let me uh, illustrate this with an example. Let's say if a person is walking in a garden with a language learner and asks, hey, do you like the tulips? Aren't they pretty? Then he sees that the learner looks a little confused. And the learner expresses her confusion by saying, tulips? At that point, the first person might say the flowers and might even point to them. This could make the word tulips comprehensible and help the learner learn this new word. So in other words, this is the interaction is helping because it's helping make the input comprehensible more than just passive listening. Sometimes, however, the interaction gives more than just comprehensible input. Sometimes it gives useful information about the language. So, for example, sometimes the learner is trying to speak and is grasping for a certain word, and the other person actually says that word for him. Uh, to illustrate this, imagine that two people are walking. The language learner points to the ground and says, careful, it's... Um, um, at that point, the other person says, ice, yeah, the ice is slippery. Notice in this example how the learner was struggling to say something but didn't know how to say it, but the other person gave it to her. These interactions create some very meaningful and memorable experiences for the learners. Sometimes maybe the learner says something that is unclear because of incorrect grammar or vocabulary, but with interaction, the other person can ask her a question to clarify the meaning. But that question actually provides the grammar form or the vocabulary the learner needs to learn. So to illustrate this, imagine that a learner is trying to talk to a native speaker. Imagine she says, um, I was in USA two years already. The native speaker might respond by saying, oh, you've been in the US for two years already? 
notice how this question or kind of like a, a recast of the, what the learner had said provides the learner with a model of the present perfect grammar form that she needed to use to express herself but didn't actually know and couldn't use. So in a sense, the interaction hypothesis is an application of Vygotsky's theories to, um, to crashing. During interaction, one person scaffolds the other person's comprehension or production of language, and that helps the learner use the language at a level higher than her actual level of competence. It helps her acquire the language faster. So just to clarify, Long wasn't disagreeing with Krashen that input drives acquisition. He was just clarifying that interactive input is superior because the interaction scaffolds the learner to comprehend the input better. Long is not arguing for explicit grammar teaching. The type of learning Long describes takes place during authentic communication, not drills, worksheets, not grammar exercises. Another SLA theory that seems to be largely a reaction to Krashen's extreme assertions is Swain's output hypothesis. The output hypothesis argues that speaking and writing also help learners to acquire second languages, not just listening and reading, as Krashen claims. Swain was a researcher in the bilingual schools of Canada. They'd been trying to apply Krashen's idea of teaching second languages only through listening and reading activities and were disappointed with the results they were getting. They found learners learn much faster when given opportunities to speak and write instead of just listening and reading. But the question is, why? What was it about the speaking or the writing that was speeding up the acquisition? So as a result, Merrill Swain hypothesized that speaking and writing were somehow helping learners learn faster, and her idea was called the output hypothesis. Her original output hypothesis simply argues that the learner speaking and writing is helpful because the learner uh, has more input, uh, albeit self-generated input. In other words, you're listening to yourself and that's increasing your input and it's the best kind of input because it's very comprehensible because it's the input that you produce yourself. Um, the realization that learners needed to use the language for authentic communication led to the development of a teaching movement called communicative language teaching or the communicative approach. This style of teaching focuses largely on activities that provide interesting and challenging opportunities for the learners to practice spontaneous speaking or writing for actual communication. These activities are usually very fun and engaging for learners because they are usually basically games. So one example of a game a teacher might play for communicative language learning is 20 questions. Uh, you know, the game, 20 questions, the guessing game. One person thinks of something while the others ask yes, no questions to get more information about what it is. They want to be able to guess what it is. They ask yes, no questions, right? Like, is it an animal? Is it a plant? Uh, is it hard? <laughs> is it soft? <laughs> right, so notice how this activity provides a natural communicative grammar practice, and best of all, it's actually fun. So a game like that uh, gives the um, learners opportunities to practice forming yes-no questions, but in a meaningful way instead of you know, a worksheet or a drill. Another theory of SLA that followed Krashen was Richard Schmidt's noticing hypothesis. Um, but this one kind of goes in the face of Krashen because it focuses really on conscious learning. That's really what it's all about. It's, it's proposing that learning is very, very conscious and deliberate and takes attention. With this theory of learning, Richard Schmidt built on our understanding of how we acquire language by actually using it for authentic communication. Schmidt argues that learners learn a new word or, or grammar form faster if they notice it consciously while communicating with others. Notice 
how this theory is in such contrast to Clash, Krashen's claim that all language acquisition is somehow unconscious. So let me give you an example of um, to illustrate the noticing hypothesis. So say, for example, that a learner doesn't know the word doorknob. Now imagine he reaches for a doorknob and finds it broken. Suddenly the learner standing next to him says, wow, it looks like the doorknob is broken. At this point, the learner is exposed to this new word, doorknob, in a very meaningful, comprehensible, and memorable way. It seems very relevant and necessary to them. According to Schmidt, that learner will be learning that new word much faster because of this noticing experience that drew his attention, conscious attention, to the new word. Schmidt believed we could even learn grammar this way. In 1995, uh, Swain applied Schmidt's ideas to revise her output hypothesis. Once again, moving away from Krashen and his ideas. She argued that challenging speaking or writing tasks caused learners to notice the gaps in their own proficiency. In other words, when people have to speak or write in a second language, they become more aware of the grammar and vocabulary that they don't know, but need to know in order to complete the task. That in turn causes them to pay more attention to the input around them to get those words in forms that they need. She also argued that learners are are often unsure how to correctly use certain words or grammar forms. They might have some ideas about what's right and what's wrong, but they're not really certain about whether those ideas are correct. So for this reason, you could say that learners are constantly testing hypotheses they have about the language each time they speak or write. See, when you're uh, listening or reading, you don't necessarily have to pay so much attention to grammar forms. Most grammar forms are not necessary for the comprehension. You can just see the words and kind of uh, get the gist, use uh, top-down strategies to understand without necessarily mastering the grammar forms. But when you're speaking or writing and you actually have to produce the grammar form, then you're put in the situation where you're either going to be producing it correctly or or incorrectly and so when they're doing that they're they're thinking about whether wondering about whether it's correct or not and then looking at people's faces looking for feedback looking for a reaction to see whether their production was successful or not so when they speak and the other person seems to understand them, it confirms the learner's hypothesis about the target language. It says they're doing something right. But when they speak and the listener doesn't seem to understand, it suggests that they're doing something incorrectly. Maybe they're using the word or grammar form incorrectly. And this negative feedback forces the learners to re-examine what they think they know about the language. And once again, pay more attention to the input. About the same time Swain was improving her theories, other researchers were also developing theories to explain why authentic communicative practice was so valuable for developing fluency in a second language. And once again, it seems that they're moving farther and farther away from Krashen's strong ideas about language learning. So one of those theories is skill learning theory, which is just basically an application of regular psychological cognitive thinking, applying it to language learning. In other words, they're basically saying that learning a language is like learning any other skill, that it's not all about some special innate magical LAD or anything like that. So skill learning theory argues that we often start learning a skill with explicit knowledge. In fact, they like to call it declarative knowledge because it is a type of knowledge that we can verbalize or explain to others, something we're conscious of. Eventually with practice, however, the skill becomes very 
automatic and the explicit knowledge is no longer needed to support it. And at that point, it becomes implicit knowledge or what they call procedural knowledge. Uh, once you've got that implicit knowledge or procedural knowledge, you no longer need the awareness of the rules. The behavior has been internalized and you can lose or forget the explicit knowledge. So you'll still be able to continue following the process or carrying out those rules without fully knowing those rules. And this would explain the fact that people are not really aware of the rules or conscious of the rules that they're following when they're using a language. An example of this uh, in action would be a child learning to tie his shoelaces. At first, um, you might need to teach that child some sort of uh, mnemonic device, a rhyme or a song to help them remember that, you know, first you make the loop-de-loop -loop, and then you wrap the other one around the loop and then you pull it through the loop. Right, you know, so the, the kid might learn something uh, like that, explicitly learn the process and use that to scaffold their own um, shoelace tying. But eventually the shoelace tying becomes so automatic that we can do it without even thinking. It's just like our hands just move automatically and we tie our shoelaces. We don't even have to think about how we tie our shoelaces. We lose or we forget our explicit knowledge and and these people are saying that language learning is much the same way or at least second language learning is much the same way it starts with explicit knowledge and gradually moves to become implicit knowledge so as you can see skill learning theory argues that learning languages is just like learning any other skill like tying a necktie, driving a car. It's just a whole lot more complicated, much more intense than those other skills. Uh, moving even further away, we get into connectivism. Now, connectivism is based on actual brain research, and it's another theory that explains why authentic practice is so important for second language learning. Connectivism supposes that meaningful and authentic practice helps learners build connections or neural pathways in the brain. So in other words, anytime your brain is doing some activity, uh, there are two, two parts of your brain, two neurons that are connecting uh, with one another, um, sending electrons, uh, electrical signals back and forth. Um, so they're saying that with practice, um, the, the more we use those connections, the faster we can use them in the future, that they, the, the, every time you use it, it gets faster for the next time. At first, the first time you make that connection, it takes a lot of effort. But next time, it takes less effort and even less effort after that. So in this way, learners don't really need to learn rules. Um, they're exposed to the language, the language has rules, and they're making these connections or associations, uh, connections between their neurons. So it appears that they're following rules, but all they're actually doing is building connections in the brain, and the connections mirror the language or resemble the language, and that's why it appears to follow rules, because the language has rules. All right. So to understand connectivism, it helps me to imagine a field of tall grass. So now imagine, imagine you have to walk across this field, touch a tree on the other side and come back. The first time you do this, it will be very hard because you will have to push your way through this tall grass. The second time you do it, however, it might be easier because you've already trampled down the grass a little bit. If you do it many more times, you will eventually have a path through the field and you can cross it very quickly and easily. So as you can see, um, these are all essentially cognitivist theories that respond to or build on crashing in one way or another. And some of them really go as far as to basically refute him. Now, just so you understand, not every contemporary uh, SLA theory is cognitivist or a reaction to crashing. 
Some researchers, uh, for example, uh, are very focused on the social environment. And they believe that um, the social environment and the identity of the learner uh, play important roles in determining whether a learner can be successful or not. So they're focused on something very different, what's going on outside of the learner instead of what's going on inside the learner's mind. Of course, the learner's feelings are relevant, but it's different. So let's take uh, Schumann's acculturation model for an example of one of these theories that focuses on social environment. Um, yeah, so Schumann was very focused on the learner's environment and how much access or exposure the learner has to the language and also um, interested in the learner's motivation, the learner's relationship to the target language, the people who use that target language or that target language culture. Schumann argued that there are some people who don't want to learn the local language when they live in another country because they don't respect that language's people for one reason or another. Maybe they're colonists or whatever, and they're, or they just, uh, yeah, they don't like them. So they don't want to talk to them, so they don't bother to learn the language. Um, but sometimes the problem isn't the learner. Sometimes the local people themselves are not inclusive. Maybe they are not welcoming the person, not including them, not, not helping them, not talking to them, not integrating with them. So a problem could be segregation and discrimination, and racism, for example. In either case, the learner won't learn the language because the learner does not have access. So it's not necessarily about what's going on in the learner's mind, okay? All right, so um, we're going to be talking a lot about these other directions in SLA research in the future. So I'm just giving you a heads up about what kind of things that uh, you can be interested in with SLA besides cognition and crashing. Um, a lot of SLA researchers are more interested, for example, in age, motivation, culture, identity, psychological health, literacy, previous education, learning styles. Um, they might be interested in the effects of trauma, for example, or learning disabilities. Uh, we're going to be talking about more of those things in future presentations. I hope this uh, video was interesting and helpful for you. All right. Thank you very much.